This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Scientology is a belief system created by L. Ron Hubbard that does fundamentally believe that we are all immortal spiritual beings called Thetans, that we have native godlike potential, that there is nothing more powerful in the universe than a Thetan. Like, so godlike is, you know, quite literal here. And that through various decisions Thetans have made, they have fallen away from their native godlike power to uh, fallen down to a state where most Thetans aren't even aware that they are Thetans, aren't even aware that they ever um, have lived before or have these powers. And that Thetans are now in a state where they're trapped in bodies, trapped here on earth, uh, trapped in this prison of a physical universe, trapped on this prison of a planet. And that only Scientology can restore a Thetan to its native state. There's one primary Thetan animating each body. Later in Scientology, you learn there's actually like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of like sick, unconscious, half dead Thetans stuck to you that are huh. now the, an additional cause of problems for you. Sure. But fundamentally at the lower levels, the non-confidential levels, there's just one Thetan per body. That would be correct. So what can make it challenging to adequately and completely describe Scientology in the beginning is what Scientologists believe actually changes as they progress further into or further up in Scientology. So um, the explanation as I've given it is pretty consistent with what you would get at the lowest levels, right? right? You're a Thetan, I'm a Thetan, everyone's a Thetan, and we have a reactive mind. L. Ron Hubbard would say the reactive mind is a collection of uh, these recordings, mental recordings of any moments of pain and unconsciousness you've ever had in your life. It's like the subconscious mind. Uh, it's always recording in moments of pain and unconsciousness. And that these are called, uh, these recordings are called, L. Ron Hubbard called them engrams. Now, when L. Ron Hubbard first wrote Dianetics in 1950, this was before Scientology came along uh, a couple years later, right? So in 1950, when he wrote Dianetics, it wasn't a spiritual endeavor. It was supposed to be a mental health, a science of mental health. Mm -hmm. So as of that time, the earliest engram you could have was the incident of birth. Being born mm -hmm. was an engram. And uh, technically in Dianetics, he said you could have prenatal engrams, like when you're still in the womb. Mm -hmm. But there was no concept of past lives as of 1950 version of Dianetics, right? And so the idea there was that uh, the reactive mind is essentially a stimulus response mechanism uh, created through evolution millions of years ago to protect the individual from things that would harm them. In other words, things that would bring about pain and unconsciousness. So you have these recordings of things that hurt you, mm -hmm. created pain and unconsciousness. And in present time, these things will react upon you in a way to cause you to avoid similar things reacting upon you in a, in a subconscious, unconscious way. So the reactive mind protects you from the trauma that is inside your subconscious mind. Yes, and the idea is we've now, as human beings, evolved to a state where it no longer serves us beneficially, it only serves us negatively. Mm -hmm. This was Hubbard's theory. And he said, so you can get rid of these engrams by you know, basically recalling them and going over them again and again using Dianetics auditing therapy. And if you get back to the moment of birth and erase the earliest engram, all the other subsequent engrams on the chain would vanish. Oh, nice. So there's a chain. Earlier, similar, earlier, similar, earlier, similar, earlier, similar. Okay. So that gives you a pretty good understanding of how L. Ron Hubbard thought of the mind, because that carries on, has applicability later on in Scientology. Probably what Hubbard took it from. Um, in the early days of Dianetics, before he decided psychiatry was evil, yes. uh, he actually credited Sigmund Freud with some of the shoulders he was standing on sure. in writing Dianetics. 
as I've just described, that is the fundamental. That, like, is. Okay. that is pretty much the nuts and bolts of Dianetics. Was it applied? Was it applied often? Oh, yeah. No, that's what Dianetics in the early days was all about, was just auditing. Auditing is the process of the one-on-one -on -one counseling, recall a moment of pain and unconsciousness, run through the engram over and over and over again, find something earlier similar. That is Dianetics auditing. One of the main things that changed with Scientology is that birth or prenatal engrams were no longer the earliest engrams on the chain. Yeah. The idea is you have to get the earliest engram on the chain for the later ones to blow, which is a race. Mm -hmm. And so, but all of a sudden now with the uh, addition of an immortal spiritual being into the equation, well, now the earliest incident could be trillions of years ago in other galaxies and universes. Other universes? So before the oh, origin yeah. of this universe? Yes. Is there a model of physics integrated in any of this? No. Okay. The model is you have the physical universe, and then above that, you have the theta universe. So we used the word Thetan earlier. Mm -hmm. So in Scientology, they also use the word theta. I don't know. Theta is just basically Thetan power. Thetans collectively. So Hubbard would say you have the theta universe, which is senior to the physical universe and creates the physical universe. Mm -hmm. And remember, I said, I said native godlike potentials. So we're not talking about the god who created the earth. We're just like Scientologists don't believe in a god, but we'll get into that later. Uh, we're talking about cre just creating universes. Like, just think like Matrix. Like, just yeah. when I say creating a universe, essentially just creating different Thetan simulations. I totally agree. In fact, it's one of the <sighs> thrusts uh, I have on my channel is wanting to talk about Scientology in a way that would actually resonate with current Scientologists, yeah. not just resonate with former Scientologists. I want people who are still in to be able to hear how I talk about it and go, wow, he's being really fair yeah. and really accurate. He's I mean, not just a hater, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'll just say, it's interesting to note, you would never get a representative of the Church of Scientology to sit down and have a conversation with you and even be as fair and accurate about Scientology as I'm going to be, which is, which is noteworthy. You would think so. Well, we'll talk about the other ways you could do that, which is through manipulation, through propaganda, through control media and all that kind of stuff. They paint themselves into a corner of not being able to send a representative out into the world to speak honestly about it because you're literally not allowed to. So when faced, you know, if you're just sitting down with an entertainment journalist, mm -hmm. a representative might be able to fudge their way through an interview, but sitting down uh, for a long form format interview with someone who is going to ask them about Xenu and the body Thetans and Leah Remini and Lisa McPherson, that's a no-go zone. So, so I, I'm representing why it will never happen, but shit, I would, I would tune in for that interview. I mean, you, I, I hope you do get someone. Anyone over there, if they've done their homework, knows you're going to be as fair as anyone in the world's going to be. And yet, there's simply things they're not allowed to talk about. And they're not even allowed to say, I'm not allowed to talk about it. It's not even a matter of training. It's that there's an entire, the entire upper half of Scientology's bridge is simply confidential. I mean, and I never even did those levels when I was in Scientology. I didn't learn what Scientologists actually believe on those upper levels until after I got out of Scientology and I was freaking born and raised in it. So I was four years old when my mom got introduced to Scientology yeah. and she got in really fast, really quick. Um, so, but I was 12 years old when I was taken out of school and started officially full-time working for Scientology. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in various capacities, I worked for them from the ages of 12 to the age of 26. Yeah. Okay, so... And then I was 34 when I officially parted ways with Scientology, uh, which was really more them officially parting ways with me, but we can get into all that later. That's just kind of how Scientology does it. And what do you do now in terms of Scientology? So now I run Growing Up in Scientology, the YouTube channel, but what I primarily do is I help run an organization that helps people who are escaping from Scientology. I'm the vice president of the Aftermath Foundation. And um, we created the foundation after the television show, Leah Remini, Scientology in the Aftermath. Mm -hmm. And there was such an outpouring of support from non-Scientologists all over the world. What can we do to help people leave Scientology? That uh, we decided to create a foundation and uh, it's been incredibly 
successful. We've helped people escape from all regions and echelons of Scientology. We, we, we've accomplished, what we've accomplished is far beyond what we actually envisioned would be possible. It's been a huge success. So that when I say godlike, I really just mean, you know, Thanos, like unlimited. Scientologists don't believe in a God. So when I say God-like, I just mean the most powerful entity, the creator, the, the prime mover unmoved, except we are all that. Uh, you know, a Thetan in definition, uh, uh, in Scientology, a Thetan has no position in space or time. A Thetan does not actually exist in the physical universe. It might choose to locate itself in the physical universe, right? And then forget that it made that decision and then sort of get caught and trapped in the physical universe. But that once the Thetan is uh, restored to its native powers, um, everything you see here in the physical universe is just a Thetan playing a game. Like literally, we are in a simulation right now of some Thetan. So like physics doesn't have to make sense when we're talking about it this way. Like technically you're a Thetan, I'm a Thetan, we're here, but it could, this could also all just be another Thetan's game. Correct. Scientology has this concept of the dynamics. L. Ron Hubbard breaks life into eight different dynamics and the eight, uh, dynamic meaning a thrust towards survival. Mm -hmm. So he would say, you know, the first dynamic is you yourself. Second dynamic is your family. Third dynamic is any other group that you're a part of other than your family. Fourth dynamic is all humankind. Uh, the fifth dynamic is plant and animal life, all non-human life. Uh, sixth dynamic is the physical world. Seventh dynamic is sort of like spirituality collectively, Thetans, us as Thetans. Mm -hmm. uh, and the eighth dynamic, L. Ron Hubbard says, Scientology doesn't deal with the eighth dynamic, but we recognize that people have this idea of a supreme being. And so Scientology says, you can call the eighth dynamic the supreme being dynamic, but we call it infinity. Just the allness of everything without having to define it. And then they sort of do a little dance and they're like, Scientology, the purpose of Scientology is to get you to the point where you have your own understandings or realizations about the nature of the eighth dynamic. We don't tell you what you have to believe about that. And technically speaking, that is true. Technically yeah. speaking, that is true. There's no point in Scientology where they sit you down and say, you're now required to revoke your belief in a supreme being. It's just that everything in Scientology is, is inconsistent with a belief in the supreme being. You can still find Scientologists who through cognitive dissonance will tell you they believe in a supreme being. Mostly they're lying to you. Sure, the only way you could reconcile a supreme being is if you say a single supreme being created all theta. Yeah. Like the spiritual big bang. Yep. But that's not what most people think when they, when they talk about God. They're talking about a creator of the physical universe. Yes. That there's no theta. Right. I mean, even as I've described Scientology so far, none of what I've said is something I even subject to ridicule. Yeah. This is pretty common sense stuff, actually. I mean, if you believe in spirituality or spirits at all, there's nothing I've described so far that's crazy. Yeah. You know, believing in past lives isn't particularly unique or special. Right. Um, the fact that Scientology does this little dance of pretending to believe in a God, I mean, it's even like a PR line. Scientology representatives will tell you, you can be a Christian and be a Scientologist. Well, let me tell you what, Christians don't believe in past lives and lives on other galaxies and planets and universes. They, but, and Scientology knows that. Scientology knows you can't be a Christian and be a Scientologist, but they will say that. It's just an example of sort of the fundamental baked in dishonesty. <music> While going through that process with the IRS for the second time, by the way, Scientology actually had tax exemption in the early days and the IRS pulled it mm -hmm. and then they got it back in 1993. While going through that process again, the IRS actually took issue with the fact that Scientology was claiming you could be a Scientologist and a member of another religion. The IRS actually said, pump the brakes there. Yeah. If you're going to say that, we're going to say you're not a religion. Yeah. And they actually in, put in writing to the IRS, no, 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 that's not what we meant. That's not what we meant. <laughs> it, it, we meant in the beginning, you can be both, but eventually you yeah. just have to be a Scientologist. So it would be all of that because survival is the, uh, the dominant force across all the dynamics. That, I mean, L. Ron Hubbard, it was either Dianetics or Science of Survival. He, he, he says he discovered the principle upon which all life exists. And that is 
all life, no matter what it is trying to do. Are you ready, Lex? Mm -hmm. It's trying to survive. But here's the thing, Lex, here's the thing. It is consistent with prior efforts yeah. or studies. It's just that L. Ron Hubbard said this was a watershed breakthrough that it was being discovered for the first time. That's kind of what I'm mocking, really. People declare this sure. is the coolest. That's the only thing I'm really mocking is yes. that this discovery that life is trying to survive is greater than the discovery of fire. Okay, I mean, it gets a little silly, but that's fine. We can agree that the fact that life is trying to survive has meaning and is meaningful and can be is valuable and, it, and it's, it's true. I mean, life is trying to survive. And the way L. Ron Hubbard in Scientology defines survival is very much intertwined with how they define ethics. Ethics, anything, you know, to be ethical is pro-survival, to be unethical is counter-survival. But we were talking about just the concept of the dynamics, like what does survival refer to? And it actually does refer to all of them, but just keep in mind when it comes to the seventh dynamic, Thetans collectively, um, involved in here is the idea that a Thetan cannot die. There's no such thing as killing a Thetan. A Thetan can only, can only survive. And so, um, anyway, uh, this concept of the dynamics is one of the most fundamental and important concepts in Scientology. But, but because I mentioned that it also gets tied up with ethics, mm -hmm. and this probably speaks to what you were just talking about, is you can have the ideas and the concepts, and you can have how do they go wrong, because they hold that Scientology, applying Scientology, getting people into Scientology, is the key to basically saving every spiritual being in existence. Mm -hmm. When you're analyzing what is ethical, it becomes whatever's good for Scientology becomes by definition ethical because anything that's good for Scientology, which is a third dynamic, is inherently good for all the dynamics. So that's where you get the ends justifying the means to do any anything possible, any, use any means necessary to forward the aims of Scientology. Mm -hmm. In some respects, Scientology created a near perfect communist experiment in its C organization. What is it? From everyone according to their ability to each according to their need or something like that? Scientology C organization is damn near a perfect communist experiment. Coming from someone who doesn't necessarily know what the perfect communist experiment really is, because I'm not grew up in a cult lex. You can't but keep you... using that as an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny tagline I use yeah, in my videos. I like it. But like it, it is interesting that an organization that is so hyper capitalist and so money hungry and is known to be very wealthy at its core is run by these group of Sea Org members that live a communist lifestyle. We're gonna jump around. Let's yeah. go. What is Sea Org? What is Sea Organization? What is this organization? The Sea Organization is the most dedicated version, the most dedicated brand of Scientologists. So there's three like echelons of Scientologists. There's public who just live normal lives in the real world and they pay to do Scientology courses and auditing. Mm -hmm. Then there's staff members who also live in the real world, uh, but work on two and a half year contracts or five year contracts at their local Scientology organization. And then once they finish their contract, their, their debt is paid or whatever. And then there's the Sea Org members. These are the guys who sign the billion year contracts. Mm -hmm. They don't have lives in the outside world. They don't own property. They live in Scientology provided housing. They eat, Scientolo they eat in Scientology run cafeterias. Is there they an actual contract that says a billion years? It's symbolic, but yes. Okay. Like, no, it's not a legally enforceable contract. <laughs> they haven't succeeded in enforcing it in any a, a subsequent lifetimes yet. Yeah, those are the billion year guys. You hear a lot about the billion year contract, the billion year contract. That's the Sea Org. And, and uh, all of Scientology management, international management, middle management, continental management, and even some lower level service orgs are one composed 100% of Sea Org members. You're not allowed to marry or date someone who's not in the Sea Org. Uh, you're also not allowed to have children. With anybody outside of Sea Org or in general, you're not allowed to have children. Sea Org members are not allowed to have children unless they leave the Sea Org. If you, they're, you're expected to uh, yeah. have an abortion and stay in the Sea Org because it's the greatest good for Scientology if you accidentally get pregnant. Interesting, because it distracts from the focus of the work. Yeah. What about sexual relations? Only once married. But that's why people get married after like three days. You know, like... Hey, you, you look, you, you look to, all right. Let's get married. Are you allowed to have divorce? Yeah, you get divorced a lot in the Sea Org. I, I've known people who get married and divorced three times by like by the age of 25. Oh, wow. Okay. Because in the Sea Org, getting married is practically like dating. Right. Also, 
unless you're married, you're living in dorms with a bunch of other people. So in order to get your own room, you also have to get married. So there's many benefits. Everyone in the Sea Org makes $50 a week. Everybody. Except David Miscavige. But, right. and, and some, uh, some posts might have a cash bonus incentive structure, but fundamentally their pay is $50 a week. So, so even the head of a big Scientology organization is getting 50 bucks a week. They don't have to give you anything at all. It's just, cons oh, you mean like, what's the idea behind not paying? Yeah, basically not paying. Everything you need is already being provided for you. You're not here for the money. You're working all the time anyway. It's not like you don't have days off. I mean, you're, you're, you're working all the time. There's, there's not, it's, there's no concept of the weekends. There's no, oh, thank God it's Friday. Friday's just another day. It's very similar to just any other um, business. As far as you're going to have your human resources, you're going to have your sales, you're going to have your accounting, your operations, your quality control. It's just that in Scientology, your operations is delivering courses and auditing. So your operations and your quality control are where most of the activity occurs as far as delivering Scientology. And then you've got your, you call it business development, but that's just bringing in new members, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the function of a Scientology organization is very... Uh, very comparable to a, a normal business in the normal world. So let's talk about the products of this business, auditing and courses. So what's auditing? So auditing is, uh, so we described earlier, Dianetics auditing. Scientology auditing is um, very similar to that. So at first glance, it, it looks like psychotherapy, a kind of therapy. All Scientology auditing is going to look like that. It's one-on-one -on -one talk therapy. Uh, you're in a a room by yourself, no distraction, no noise. One on one. Yeah. So like this. Yeah. But and in Scientology, they have what's called an e-meter. <laughs> right. Almost all auditing employs the use of an e-meter. What's an e-meter? So an e-meter is a device that just measures the resistance to a small electrical flow. Mm -hmm. Except Scientologists believe that this e-meter can be used to simply direct the progress of an auditing session to determine whether. Uh, the auditing has reached a good, satisfactory conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, all auditing sessions have to end on a satisfactory conclusion. Like that's the job of the auditor. There's, you don't just, it's not like, sorry, the session sucked. See you next week. It's not like that. Every auditing session has to end um, on a positive note. And if it doesn't, uh, there's corrections to be made. So um, the e-meter, Okay, so let's say that the meter's in front of me and you're the one holding the cans. I'm holding the cans, so you're, inter you're doing the auditing of me. Yeah. Okay. okay, I'm holding the cans. No, literally in the beginning of an auditing session when you're calibrating the sensitiv sensitivity of the e-meter, you do a, a can squeeze. So I go, squeeze the cans, please. Okay, so I'm just like squeezing the yep, cans. And I'm just changing the sensitivity because when you squeeze the cans, I want to get about a one third of a dial drop on the needle. The idea is you don't want, if the needle's too sensitive, then every time you shift around in your chair, the needle's going to bounce all over the place. So you're trying to set the sensitivity of this thing. And that's all, the, the, the knob there on the bottom to the left, that's the sensitivity knob. And that determines just, uh, how much, how sensitive the needle's gonna be. And the the bigger dial is called the tone arm. And that is changing, uh, I wanna say voltage or current, but I'm not intending, I'm gonna get one of those words is wrong, right? Yeah, so here's even how, just how a Scientology auditor believes it works. Mm -hmm. You're holding the cans, there's a tiny little battery in that emitter that's sending, and you're completing the circuit when you pick up the cans, right? So you got a little thing going there. And that needle will respond to your physical movement, but that's not what we want. We want you to sit the hell still so that we can read this thing when I'm asking you questions. Okay. So you're sitting there still, very still. As still as you can, yeah. comfortable, right? And I'm gonna go, is there something you're withholding from me? Mm -hmm. And what I'm looking for is right when I say at the end of me, I'm looking for the needle to dip to the right. That's what it's used for. Except it's an enforced conversation. So I'll yeah. give you a really good example of this. So you're holding the cans. Say, is there anything you're withholding from me? And I get an instant read. And I go, is there anything you're withholding from me? You're going to go, oh, I don't think so. And I don't see the needle. No, you don't. you don't see the needle. Okay. 
I go, well, what did you think of when I asked you the question? Now, if you've already had a lot of auditing, you know how this goes. It means I got an instant read and we're not going mm -hmm. to move on until this question gets resolved. Okay, so you're gonna go, I don't know what I was thinking of. And then I'm gonna I'll be like, you know, take a look and I'll help you out here. I'll try to steer you. Okay, so I'm looking to get roughly the same read while you're thinking about whatever. I mean, yeah. What was that? What was that right there? And you can start digging to what? You can start- I just want an answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I can go to memory. Yeah, and you can give me any answer you want. There's no way for me to know if you're giving me the right answer, but I want you to give me something. Yeah. If you say you can't give me anything, I'm gonna keep using the emitter until you give me something. Yeah. Okay, so let's say you give me something. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get all the details about that. And until like time, place, form an event, I wanna know everything that happened. I wanna know all the details. And by the way, I'm writing all this down. So I'm taking notes of everything you're telling me that it's a bad thing that you did that you haven't told me about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm keeping notes. When you represent to me that you've told me everything there is to tell, I'm looking for the needle to give like a smooth back and forth motion like this. Mm -hmm. And Scientology calls that a floating needle. That means in Scientology land, we're done with that. So now I might go back to check the question. Okay, good, I'll check the question again. Is there anything you're withholding from me? Ooh, if I get another read, we gotta go through the process again. Okay, if you tell me I've told you everything and I don't get a floating needle, I've gotta go, okay, is there an earlier similar thing? Have you basically done an earlier similar thing? Is there an earlier similar time you haven't told someone something or is there an earlier similar thing to the, that you did to the thing that you just told me? Mm -hmm. We're gonna keep going earlier, similar, earlier, similar, earlier, similar until I get a floating needle. And that's where I'm explaining it this way. You can see how mm -hmm. no matter what the specific auditing session happens to be about, there's still the potential in any auditing session that you're going into past lives. Yeah. Just because you have to go earlier, similar until you get a floating needle. Okay. Now here's how Scientologists think the e-meter actually works. Meaning why does the e-meter work? So we, we talked before about these, um, these mental pictures, right? These recordings, mm -hmm. okay. Well, we spoke about engrams, just recordings of pain and unconsciousness. Well, Scientology would hold the, the bad recordings aren't the only recordings that you have. Those are just the recordings in your reactive mind. Mm -hmm. You also have an analytical mind, which is just your conscious memory, conscious recording of everything from present time to the last 76 trillion years. Yep. And Hubbard would say that these memories are actually a perfectly detailed recording, I think it says like 56 perceptions or something, and that it's perfect. And you can access that information, you just have trouble doing so. Okay, so he says that these recordings, these mental pictures have actual electrical charge and mass. Now you asked before, is there any actual physics in this? I don't know, where are you supposed to store the pictures of your last 76 trillion years that have charge and mass? I don't see it, but Hubbard says it's there, okay. So he says that these things have mass and when you recall them or put attention on them, you create an electrical flow, which maybe through magnetic fields or whatever, impinges upon the electrical flow of the e-meter mm -hmm. and it shows up as a read on the needle. That's how, Scientolo that's how Scientologists believe that's why the needle reads. Mm -hmm. Now, cynics would say the needle only reads on palm sweat and movement. Well, I know that's not true. Mm -hmm. Right, I, I can't tell you everything the needle does read on, but I can tell you it's not just moving your hands and sweaty hands. You yeah, want your needle to float. For both people. Yes. And it's probably a great experience when you're like, yes, it's yeah. like a gamified feeling, right? Well, when you're training on how to use the e-meter, there are drills where you practice generating with your mind mm -hmm. various needle reactions. So, you know, there is a drill where you sit there and you consciously try to create a floating needle by recalling happy thoughts. Yeah. Go to your happy place. And at the end of every auditing session, you actually have to go to an, uh, a third party, sit down in front of an e-meter and verify that your needle's floating. Nice. Every single auditing session not only has to end on a floating needle, but then you have to go to someone else and have the floating needle verified. Mm -hmm. Any Scientologist who's uh, a seasoned recipient of auditing knows how to make their needle float at the examiner. <laughs> sure. A lot of people find auditing very helpful. I mean, I've heard some describe it as quite thoroughly addictive. Me mm -hmm. personally, I never enjoyed getting auditing. That's probably more a function of having been raised in it. And it was never something sure. I wanted to do. It was something that was forced on me as a child, you know, and also I was never I don't like talking about private secret stuff. Like yeah. you kind of you kind of have to want to be an open book sure. to to 
honestly and thoroughly participate in an auditing session? Because there's not necessarily a belief that this is going to be private. There's no expectation of privacy, but there's no expectation that your stuff's going to be leaked for blackmail either. I mean, you kind of, you trust the people in the organization. Even despite rumors and stuff like that, but the rumors are coming from people that are lying to you, essentially. If you're a Scientologist and you're participating in an, participating in an auditing session, you know that anyone in the organization is has the ability to know the stuff that you talk. It's not like, oh my God, I'm only telling my auditor because I think no one's ever going to know. Yeah. You know that people know, yeah. but you also trust the organization. How quickly does it go to past memories? For people who are seasoned, like they actually like going past life. Yeah. I, I hated it. I would make sure, I was really good at making my needle float. I didn't want to have some auditor because I never believed in the past life memories. Yeah. So I didn't want to be in that impassable, you know, reach an impasse in an auditing session where I was being asked for something I couldn't provide because I knew this auditing session has to end on a good point. Yeah. But Scientologists enjoy, for the most part, going, they call it whole track. Whole track is past life, going whole track. Your time track, they call it the time track is your whole memory, mm -hmm. but whole track refers to anything past life. Okay. So going whole track or deep whole track with high reality, meaning it's not like, oh, I have a fuzzy memory and I'm not sure if it's real. Like your real seasoned Scientologists are like, oh yeah, I was on this planet oh. at this time circling this so star and this is what I was eating for breakfast. Yeah. And it goes both flows there, not just things that have happened to you, but things that you've done. Yeah. So, you know, you could be being asked for, you know, sure. you'd be going back to, I, I wiped out a civilization. I, I oh, wow. committed genocide on this race on this planet. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean. And now, you, and now <laughs> I walk around with that guilt. Wait, I'm actually a horrible person. So imagine, though, if yeah. you had, not only are you looking at, you know, if someone's being self-critical, trying to identify destructive patterns of behavior in your present life, but what if you really internalize the fact that I haven't only been this way for 40 years. Yeah. I've been this way for 40 trillion years. Yeah. But yeah. Scientology would argue that as a Thetan, you're inherently good. All Thetans are basically good. So the, the goal of the auditing procedure there would be essentially to figure out, find the moment, find what it was that caused you to make that shift as a being to dramatize you know, evil intentions and stuff like that. So even if you're going whole track, looking at all the horrible things you've done. The goal is to find like, well, what happened just prior to that? What was like the prior confusion? And what, what did you misunderstand just before that and whatnot? So the goal is basically, so Scientologists after a lot of auditing are also convinced that they have fixed mm -hmm. the reason for any non-optimum conduct. Scientology would say that Scientology is not about beliefs. It's about application of the techniques of Scientology auditing to improve someone's spiritual awareness and ability. So the belief level of Scientology is pretty much the stuff we've already discussed. The effectiveness of the auditing process. So the effectiveness of the auditing process, this is one of the things Hubbard says, is that standard tech, standard Scientology, they call it the tech, the technology of how to deliver auditing, standard tech, mm -hmm. works 100% of the time when applied 100% correctly. Well, that's kind of unfalsifiable, right? Yeah. Because anytime it doesn't work- It wasn't applied correctly. Exactly. That's a nice little uh, escape hatch to pull on having a crisis of faith. But it didn't work. Well, then obviously it wasn't applied correctly. Yeah. That's where quality control comes in. Their job is to nitpick, and you can always find one thing that wasn't done correctly. That's right. Sure. That's right. I would probably argue that auditors um, are not in a position of having many crises of faith because actually they're usually seeing people for the most part improve in some ways through the process of auditing. Now, auditing can create like a state, somewhat of a euphoric state. You feel great. You're just blown out of your head. You know, you feel you're on top of the world. I've had that in some of my auditing. As an auditor, sorry? No, as, as a person auditor. receiving auditing. Okay. And so my point is, as an auditor doing a lot of auditing, you know, you're going to have someone in front of you called the, the pre-clear is the person in front of you who's getting the auditing called the, the PC or the pre-clear. They see over and over and over again, these PCs having these sort of euphoric states and floating needles and I feel great and fantastic. And, oh, thanks. You saved my life and da, 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 da. Like, 
I've always said, if Scientology, if people didn't find Scientology helpful, nobody would ever stay in Scientology. Right. right. And so auditors are pretty much the ones doing the heavy lifting of what it even means to be a Scientologist. The, 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 those guys aren't the ones that you end up um, having crisis of faith. I mean, doing Scientology auditing, it doesn't require that you believe, just have faith that you believe something. You just have to go through these motions. And Scientologists, one of the reasons Scientologists think this is all scientific is because it's like, I don't care if you believe why this works. I care how you feel at the end of an auditing session. Mm -hmm. I would argue that what you've just described, it, it could be an identical description of what it feels like and what it means to go up Scientology's bridge to total freedom. Mm -hmm. You are reinforcing to yourself that everything's getting better and better and better. And, and you'd be like, you don't spend time with your family anymore. Yeah. You're broke, even though you make a lot of money. You're always stressed. You, you're at the beck and call of these people who seem to run your run your lives. Like how a Scientologist feels about their own life is, um, it's very interesting to compare that to how that person's life looks to their non-Scientology family members. Mm -hmm. I get contacted by a lot of people who've never been in Scientology Mm -hmm. But they're like, I got a family member who's who's really deep, and I just can you help me understand some things? Why is this person's life like this? Why is this person's life like this? So, I I don't want to say that Scientologists do not actually. I don't want to say, oh, it's all in their heads. They think they're being helped, but they're really not. That doesn't feel honest, you know. But it's this thing where if Scientology was just getting auditing when you wanted about the subjects you wanted, and you could take it or leave it, that would be fine. It's, it's the fact that it's part and parcel to this entire organization and this entire experience that has, as a part of that experience, taking everything from you, demanding everything from you, controlling who you can speak with, con controlling who you can have relationships with, who you have to erase from your life. This is where, and it's hard to, it's hard to place one pinpoint on this is where Scientology goes wrong. It's really hard to do that because the good parts of Scientology and the bad parts of Scientology are all just Scientology. Well, information control, access to the internet, access to any information critical of Scientology. Is some internet access allowed? Public Scientologist has no restrictions to their access to the internet. They're just not allowed to read anything critical of Scientology. They really push this thing that uh, unless you've been in a Scientology organization yourself, or unless you've actually been a Scientologist, you couldn't possibly know the truth about Scientology. If you're only getting information from people who aren't members or former members, then you couldn't possibly be getting the correct information. Now, they, they don't, realize the math there doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. If you can find out the true information by becoming and being a Scientologist, then that means you can get the correct information from a former Scientologist because they traveled that path and they got the correct information. Mm -hmm. So they still create this, un they try to create this unfalsifiable loop where unless you are personally doing it, you don't have correct information. And you go, well, what about the people who did personally do it, got the correct information, left, and are now sharing that with others. Well, no, those are lies. Well, okay, so so just anything you don't like is a lie. Then and you go, yeah, pretty much. That's kind of how it, that's kind of how it works. Well, these days they've pretty much, I think, thrown in the towel. But they have the Scientology middle management was <laughs> editing Wikipedia so often from IP addresses that were traced back to the Scientology buildings that. Uh, Wikipedia locked them out from any IP addresses associated with Scientology from mm -hmm. being able to edit it. It's like the Scientology was so infatuated with trying to control the information. And in the early days of the internet, they had a, a certain degree of success with that. They just, it's just hopeless these days. And I gotta tell you, it, it's one of the reasons I do my YouTube channel. It's one of the reasons I, I decided to upload every day. I've uploaded every day for the last six months. Mm -hmm. I just wanted there to be a non-stop flow of information of any kind and any variety, as long as it's fair and balanced, intelligent, interesting, that Scientologists who stumble upon the internet will go, oh, look, someone's talking about my thing. Let's see what they got going on. And, and I, I know this guy, 
the fact that Scientology crushes so much information before, before YouTube, before, like I have the only like big Scientology channel and that only got big in the last six months. Mm -hmm. Okay. So before that there were channels, there was things, but it's almost like it took a lot of, uh, like people felt like it had took a lot of bravery and courage to like say something on the internet about Scientology. And so people would pop up and there weren't very many voices. And I was like, I want this to be prolific. I want, I want to be prolific. I want to have 30 or 40 other channels being prolific so that Scientology couldn't possibly successfully control the narrative about it. Have you been personally attacked? AaronSmithLevin.com is a website created by the Church of Scientology. Have you seen it? No. What kind of content is on there? Oh, Aaron's an abusive father and a horrible husband and the worst staff member we've ever had. And mm -hmm. Um, oh, I openly talk about it because I think the fact that Scientology even does things like that is fucking hilarious. Yeah. And uh, anything they try to do to me, I'm, I, I, the way I think about it is, you know you're just giving me an opportunity to turn the mirror back on you and show everyone how horrible you are. Does it stick? No. So you find that there is ineffective. It's completely ineffective. They're so over the top. And um, well, I'll tell you how the website even came into being. Mm -hmm. So I was on the first season of Leah Remini Scientology in the Aftermath. Every single person who participated in that show got a website. <laughs> it's just that everyone else's website is like, who is markheadley.com? Who is mikerinder.com? Well, I bought who is aaronsmithlevin.com, but I was too stupid to buy Aaron. I didn't buy aaronsmithlevin.com. So I'm actually the only one who has a website in their name. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> I could com. probably get a lawyer to get it back for me, but I'm like, why? I want everyone to see what a nasty, petty, disgusting organization that this is. And nobody believes anything Scientology says anyway. Does the general public know that it comes from Scientology? Pull it up. It says right on the bottom, copyright 2000, whatever, Church of Scientology International. Like they didn't even try to hide it. links to everyone else's website on the bottom it's so funny who is okay but look, like 2021 Aftermath. church of scientology international all rights reserved here's an example of just scientology's complete lack of self-awareness mm -hmm. so me and mike render we went have these on like a house flip project right you know we Wait. the reason we created the bobblehead yeah. is because on mike render's hate site mm -hmm. scientology created a, a gif or a gif how do you say what's the right way to say it the correct way is GIF. GIF, good. Yeah. Scientology created a GIF of Mike Rinder as a bobblehead. It was an insult like, oh, all he does is sit next to Leah Remini and go, yes, Leah, yes, Leah. And so they they made a GIF of him with a bobblehead. So we were like, yeah. we're going to make Mike Rinder bobbleheads and we're going to sell them on the spshop.com to raise money for the Aftermath Foundation. I love it. Yeah. And now so that I- go I've out got, and buy- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, go to the, the spshop.com and get yourself a Mike Rinder bobblehead. Oh. Now look, now that my profile's getting a little higher, this head was made to bobble. Like this, yeah. this smooth, shiny head uh, yeah. it needs its own bobblehead now. It does, 100% <laughs> does. I can't believe it doesn't exist. So, but let me show you. So here's what's okay. happening here. We just hired some day, day laborers off of what, like Craigslist or something. Yeah. So what Scientology did was they had a private investigator stake out the, the house flip project. Mm -hmm. They were clearly running license plates of anyone who visited the property because otherwise, otherwise, how would they find out the laborers' names, look, do background checks on them yeah. to find out they had criminal records? And they published this as if it's going to ne reflect negatively on me. Yeah. Oh, we hired someone to do work who had a criminal record? Who gives a shit? Do you know one of the biggest problems people with records have is finding employment? Yeah. There's nothing bad about hiring someone who's got a criminal record to... It doesn't reflect negatively on me, Wait. but it shows you what they think about those people. It shows you what they think about people who are trying to put their lives back together and maybe you know actually work for a living. And it also shows that they're surveilling us. You're like, like they don't realize that putting this up, they're publishing information that they could only have if they're surveilling me and Mike. And it doesn't occur to them, maybe we shouldn't put that up. That's the other reason to be prolific on the internet, right? The reason Joe Rogan can't get canceled is because anyone can watch thousands of hours of the authentic Joe Rogan. You can't misrepresent him because he spent thousands of hours representing himself genuinely. Yeah. Let's go to the story of how we transitioned from that to Dear Miscavige. The current leader of Scientology. Uh, he was actually not selected by L. Ron Hubbard to take over, but ended up usurping power and taking over. Power. Right. I 
I think the quote, sometimes it gets attributed to David Miscavige is um, power, power is not given, it is assumed. Yeah, something like that. The last six years of L. Ron Hubbard's life, he was off in a seclusion, essentially hiding from lawsuits. Now, by the time Hubbard went off into seclusion, Miscavige had sort of already risen up through the ranks of the C organization. Now, Miscavige was like a teenager, either like 11, 12, 13, or something like that. Miscavige was not born into Scientology, but he was a young a young boy when his father got into Scientology. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, Miscavige did start working as a Sea Org member. So there's one organization that existed to essentially serve Hubbard directly mm-hmm. and to represent his interests. And that was called the Commodore. He was the Commodore of the Sea Organization. The Commodore's Messengers Organization, we're going to call it the CMO. Miscavige started working for the CMO um, pretty early on in his Sea Org career. By the way, as did Mike Rinder. Mm-hmm. Mini Mike. Okay. <laughs> And so uh, he just became known as a, as a doer, like a, a guy who'll get it done. No excuses, no stops, you know, get it done. So he had made a name for himself in the CMO around the time, by the time Hubbard went off into seclusion. Now, when he went off into seclusion, he took two other CMO, or I'm going to call them messengers, right? Commodore's messengers. Mm-hmm. He took two other messengers with him, Pat and Annie Broker. Now, it has been said by people, Mike, Mike Rinder has told me, he goes, the reason Pat and Annie went off with LRH isn't necessarily because he desperately wanted them to, but partly because we could afford to let them go. We didn't necessarily yeah. need them. Sure. Okay. And between the two of them, Annie was the one who was like a really compassionate person, intelligent person, caring person. Was there a possible trajectory of this world where she was the one that took over? Yes. In fact, uh, Pat and Annie Broker were the two people that were supposed to take over, Mm -hmm. okay? But because Pat and Annie were with Hubbard in seclusion, Miscavige basically had the complete run of the operation without any oversight from Hubbard. The only way any information would get from Scientology world to Hubbard Mm -hmm. is Miscavige and Pat Broker would meet at a confidential location Mm -hmm. and Miscavige would give Broker any information he wanted to go to LRH. So if Miscavige wanted to get rid of somebody, all he had to do was feed LRH false information that this person was doing had been caught doing something treasonous. Mm-hmm. And then he would get in response some order from L. Ron Hubbard to get rid of this person. Have to, so are, are there so many similarities between various communist regimes mm-hmm. and fascist regimes? Right. So whereas Pat and Annie are off with LRH, all of Scientology's attorneys and accountants and lobbyists and whatever, they all know Dave. Dave's the one they deal with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, LRH passes away. Pat and Annie make this appearance. Nobody knows Pat and Annie. Everybody knows Dave. And so he ended up getting rid of Pat and Annie. This is a very short, perhaps slightly bastardized version of it, of Miscavige, basically. They had been... They had been um, ushering just suitcases of cash to L. Ron Hubbard during this time. And, you know, Pat, like, so you have Miscavige handing boatloads of cash to Pat Broker. <sighs> Pat would do crazy things like hide the money in the walls of houses and dig pits and everything. So uh, Miscavige basically threatened to turn Pat Broker over to the IRS for tax evasion. That's part, Pat Broker is still alive. Is he a Scientologist or no? No. He basically went away and kept his Annie? mouth shut. She died a handful of years ago. She stayed a loyal Sea Org member until the very end. But yeah. literally, like Miss Gavage put her on menial tasks, like like she had no authority whatsoever. She was just put on menial tasks, I mean, washing dishes, but not really groundskeeper, just just stupid low level assistant paper pusher stuff. She never she never operated with any actual authority, even though she was supposed to be the one to take over her and Pat. First of all, I believe that Miscavige is a true believer in Scientology. I do believe that. That's a really important uh, question. Do you think he believes in all the Thetans and and all of that? He definitely believes in that. I think he believes in Scientology, but in a different way than all other Scientologists, because he's aware of a lot more information, damaging information about L. Ron Hubbard and the true story of Scientology than most people. So his version of belief is different. I'll give you one example here. So Scientology's bridge to total freedom goes up to what they call OT8, operating thing in level eight, Mm -hmm. okay? Scientologists have all been told that L. Ron Hubbard, before he passed, 
finished, completed, putting together OT 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Mm -hmm. It's just sitting in the vault waiting to be released. This is part of the Scientology belief system. Because remember, I said going up Scientology's bridge of total freedom is how you're supposed to get back to your native godlike state. Mm -hmm. While all the Scientologists in the world who've already done OT8 know that they haven't gotten there, but they still believe in Scientology because they're told there's more. Mm -hmm. But wait, there's more. Mm -hmm. Miscavige knows there is no more. So Miscavige knows the fundamental promise of being able to achieve full operating Thetan is a lie. He knows L. Ron Hubbard didn't accomplish that. So therefore, no one else is going to accomplish it as well. If L. Ron Hubbard had accomplished it, Miscavige knows, well, he didn't write it up. He didn't uh, leave instructions for how anyone else would accomplish it. So no matter what, Miscavige knows that the fundamental promise that si what Scientology is saying they will be able to deliver to mankind is a lie. Now, it's going to sound like I'm contradicting myself because it sounds like I'm saying, well, he knows it, it's bullshit. I think he believes that L. Ron Hubbard just failed to finish his work. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of hoping L. Ron Hubbard is going to come back to finish the job. Because L. Ron Hubbard did tell the people at international, the international management base, at least a core of them, that he was coming back. Now, we know that David Miscavige believed this because right around the 21-year mark, he was supposed to come back like 21 years after he died. Mm -hmm. Right around the 21-year mark, David Miscavige was getting busy putting some things in place that had to get done in case L. Ron Hubbard came back. So we know he at least believed to that level. I'm going to answer this question by first connecting some dots. Yes. Okay. Um, we spoke earlier in the interview about achieving your native godlike Yes. State. That in Scientology is called native state. Okay. Native state and full operating Thetan mean the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because at native state, you are a fully operating Thetan. Oper you know, operating meaning operating in your full capacity. So OT means operating Thetan. Mm -hmm. So the upper confidential half of Scientology's bridge are called the OT levels, the operating Thetan levels. And these, and remember, they're confidential. So most Scientologists have not done these levels. They don't know what's on them. It is on these levels that you learn about the Xenu and the body Thetan story. Can you describe Xenu, please? We spoke earlier about how at the lower non-confidential levels of Scientology's bridge, Hubbard is saying that what's wrong with you is your reactive mind. Yes. Okay. Well, in Scientology, once you've gotten rid of your reactive mind, that is what's called the state of clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after you finish state of clear, the next thing on the bridge is the OT levels. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've already gotten rid of your active mind, what the heck are you supposed to do now? Well, now L. Ron Hubbard says, okay, first, what was wrong with you was just your reactive mind. But now the next thing you have to resolve, the next thing that's wrong with you is you actually have tens of thousands of, of thetans stuck to your body and they all have their own reactive minds. Oh, wow. You have to audit the thetans. <laughs> use the e-meter, just like we spoke about, except now you've got a divider that separates the cans so they don't short circuit and you hold both cans in one hand mm -hmm. and you have the e-meter in front of you. So now you're auditing yourself. You're telepathically talking to the things that are stuck to you. You are thinking the commands instead of saying them out loud and you sort of do drills where you practice looking for e-meter reads at the instant you have a thought. You're telepathically auditing spirits that L. Ron Hubbard says are stuck to your body. Mm -hmm. Does this sound like a recipe for a mental breakdown? And you combine that with the fact that Scientology is against any forms of mental help or health outside of Scientology and you have a recipe for disaster. Now, you might go, where did all these spirits come from that are stuck to your body? This is where Xenu comes into play. So Hubbard says that 75 million years ago, Xenu uh, was basically um, a dictator. At, uh, the Galactic Confederation is like 70 something or 80 something planets somewhere in the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. And uh, Xenu was like uh, a dictator, an overlord for either one of these planets or the whole system. And they had a population problem. And Xenu was like, we need to get rid of like half the people. So we called them all in for tax audits. L. Ron Hubbard didn't like the IRS. So of course the story has to do with tax audits. Okay. Called them all in for tax audits, said psych bitches, froze them in glycol. 
loaded them up on space planes, flew them to Earth. Remember, the story has to be Earth because the story is what's wrong with us. Flew them to Earth, dropped them in volcanoes, blew them up with hydrogen bombs, and then captured them with like spirit magnets. I'm making up words because, okay. Yeah. Um, and these disembodied spirits of these people that got blown up have just been blown in the wind here on earth and they attach themselves to things and they can be in the environment and they stick to bodies and everything. And so, and they all have reactive minds. Mm -hmm. So at Scientology's upper levels, if you get sick or you have cancer or there's something wrong with you, Scientology will say, that's one of your body things. You need to get some auditing to fix the body thing. You, down. And you read it. By most accounts, Scientologists struggle when they read this for the first time because this is not consistent with what Scientologists are hoping for is on the OT levels. They're hoping for some real life-changing magic. The way these things yeah. are described and sold, they're remember, they're hoping that these OT levels are gonna make them uh, give them the ability to go like completely independent of their body at will. Yeah. Exteriorize from your body, go back into your body, you know, like I have some real Yeah, because also part of the Scientology, remember, it works 100% of the time when used 100% correctly. And if it doesn't, it could be because something's not being done right, but it also could be because you're you're doing bad things that you're not telling people about. Like if you're committing present time over its crimes, sins, Scientologists would be like, that's part of the reason auditing isn't working on you is because you're committing criminal behavior that you're not being honest about. So every Scientologist is sort of incentivized to, to make auditing work on them, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, Lex, this is where it gets a little crazy. Mm -hmm. On OT3, you learn about the OT, the, the body things for the first time. When you finish OT3, you attest to having achieved the state of having no more body things. Mm -hmm. And then you start OT4 and he's like, psych, you got more, you got more BTs, Except those other BTs, they had drug problems, and that's why you couldn't find them the first time. So we're going to do a little, something a little different here, do something a little different there. Got to get rid of these BTs that were addicted to drugs, okay? Then you finish OT4, and you're thinking, man, I hope we get to the good stuff soon. And then you get to OT5, and he's like, psych, you got more BTs. You couldn't find these BTs because they were all bunched up together in clusters. And first, you have to break up the clusters, and then you can get rid of the BTs. And you're like, okay, got to do that. And this was all L. Ron Hubbard approved. Yeah, this is from L. Ron Hubbard. And then after you finish OT5, you get rid of all the BT clusters. OT6 is just a training course to teach you how to audit OT7. Well, OT7 is now more BTs, except it's in, in the environment and stuff. You're trying to locate BTs. You can find them on your body, but it's just more BTs. Okay, and then OT8 is, remember we talked about in all these auditing sessions throughout the entire Scientology bridge, you have people who've run hundreds or thousands of past life whole track incidents. Mm -hmm. These memories have become part of their self-identity of who they even think they are. Yeah. OT8, you go through all these past life recalls and essentially I'm oversimplifying this a little bit. He goes, psych, all those past life memories weren't yours. They were your BTs. And he goes, now that you've discovered this, now you know who you are not and you are ready to find out who you really are. Well, now you're supposed to find out who you really are on OT9 and 10. Those don't exist. Do we know they don't exist? Yes. In fact, the whole story of how that became known yeah. is part of how David Miscavige was able to get rid of Pat Broker and take over power because it was believed that Pat Broker had been, was in possession of the upper unreleased OT levels. And when Miscavige determined that he was not, and there weren't in fact any levels, that was bad. That was a bad day to be David Miscavige because he now knew he had something on his hands he could not get himself out of. He's like, oh. Oh, the faith is there. Scientologists believe that these things do exist. Yeah. L. Ron Hubbard didn't leave anything behind. Does David Miscavige believe they exist? Oh no, he knows he knows they don't exist. No, Meaning but... when I say exist, oh, I don't mean do advanced um uh levels of spiritual awareness exist. When I said is it exist, I mean did L. Ron Hubbard write down what anyone is supposed to do yeah. that's called OT9? That doesn't exist. That what exactly? Everything about Scientology is that is true. To the best of my ability to know that I, I believe it to be true. 
Like, I, I'll give you small, even stupid examples. Like, Mike Rinders told a story where at the international base, Miscavige actually had, like, a copper a contraption built into the ground, like, grounded into the ground to come out where you could hold it. And he was something he sort of came up with to uh, your BT, your, it could ground your BTs could get your BTs that if you were feeling overstimulated or something, I'm probably slightly bastardizing this story, but he came up with this as a great idea, something to help someone destimulate if their BTs were getting a little too overactive use. Now, so that, that that's a stupid story that's sort yeah. of like, well, it shows you he believes in the concept of BTs if he's creating little rods to get rid of them, to ground them into the earth. So I guess humans are just, this is how they operate. Yeah. The conversation about David Miscavige gets really interesting because I could give you a, if I wanted to make the argument that he didn't believe, I could give you a dozen examples to to make that argument. Yeah. I just happen to think that uh, he believes in a different way. Yeah. Whereas your average Scientologist believes that L. Ron Hubbard was practically infallible, that he thought of everything in advance, he took care of everything before he left. And Miscavige still believes in like the main structure of this thing, but he's like, oh shit, it's falling to me to figure out how to actually make this thing happen. I, th I think Miscavige sees himself as someone who has to a certain degree had to go back and fix L. Ron Hubbard's mistakes. Do you think he sees himself as doing good for the world? I do. What about for the people of Scientology? I think in his own way he does. I don't think he wakes up thinking he's um, screwing Scientologists. I, I think he sees everyone else as screwing him. I think he sees uh, that, it, he, that it is his job to expand Scientology throughout the world and accomplish the aims of Scientology. And he sees that it's not happening. And he thinks if everyone else would just stop, if everyone else would get out of his way and stop creating problems for him, it would happen. Like, uh, I, I do think he seems sees himself as someone who is doing good. I think that's fair to say. I, th I think the evidence shows that. What about the effects of clearly power and influence that he's had and money? Yeah, without There's, question, that has served as a corrupting force. It has. Without question. Have you seen sort of evidence of that, that he's changed over time? After the 1993 IRS exemption that Scientology won back, um, and this information comes from Mike Rinder, uh, that's when David Miscavige, as soon as the checks on his power were removed, Miscavige's behavior changed markedly. Can you tell the story of Shelley Miscavige and the mystery surrounding her? I saw that there is quite a bit of mystery. Yeah. So Shelley Miscavige, for many years, held the job of her post in the C organization was David Miscavige's assistant. Mm -hmm. That was her post. It's important to truly understand that and what that means because um, the fact that she was Miscavige's wife is meaningless. And this is something that's hard to, for regular people in the regular world to truly grasp how meaningless it is in Scientology. For Sea Org members who are spouses, it means nothing. Your role matters more. In, within Sea Org. Your role is the only thing that matters. So let's say, let's say if Shelly was married to Dave, but she worked in a different organization. She would never be seen with him ever, publicly ever. Wouldn't travel with him, wouldn't go to events with him, nothing. Sometime around 2006, 2007, and I'm very oversimplifying this, okay? Shelly basically pissed off Dave to the point where he's like, okay, I, I'm done with you. I'm gonna take you off of your post. Mm -hmm. Okay. At that point, she was reassigned to another confidential Scientology base up in uh, Twin Peaks, California. Um, why am I, the reason I'm providing this type of detail is because we hear that Shelly's missing. Yeah. Okay. Well, you realize the same people who report that Shelly's missing are also the same people who will tell you exactly where she is. Okay. She works at this secretive CST, Church of Spiritual Technology base out in Twin Peaks, California. I have personal confirmation that she was seen and spoken with by someone who knew her well in, I'll say 2019. Shelly Miscavige is missing in the sense that she hasn't been seen with David Miscavige since about 2006. But because she's no longer his assistant, you would never see her with him. people who cover Scientology, who have published stories 
where Shelley's Miscavige's family member told a story to another family member who told the story to a friend, who told the story to a former Scientologist, who told the story to a journalist, who published the story, has created the impression that some of Shelley Miscavige's family members are actually talking to the press, when in fact that has never occurred. And so the very people who are publishing about Shelley Miscavige missing have contributed to the fact that Shelley Miscavige does no longer speak to those family members because she thinks they're talking to the press when they never have. It's pretty messed up. Yeah. So I believe the information that I have, that I verified, I'm, I'm, I'm putting out information, I'm the one representing it's true without revealing my sources. Sure. That Shelley was still actively in touch regularly with family members outside of the C organization since about, until about 2014. So, I mean, regularly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's no question about her safety or, uh, uh, during that period. And then someone else who knew Shelley very well uh, did see her and actually have a conversation with her in a public place in uh, 2019 or 2020. Now, somebody could still come along and be like, how do we know she's okay? It's been three years. Yeah, okay, you could say that about anybody. You know, there, there's a, 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 the nature of working in the highest levels of Scientology management at these super secretive bases. Uh, it's a very weird and unique situation. Yeah. It has isolation baked in. Oh, well, they wouldn't want to leak. They're true believers. They see... They see, like, there's a, there's sort of a conspiracy theory that runs right through all of Scientology, mm -hmm. which is that Scientology um, represents like an existential threat to the powers that really control that really control this planet. Do they have a, a face to the powers that really control? Do they have names to it? Like, who's controlling? It's Xenu's homies. Well, I'm sure that's not what they say. Xeno embodied well, in. It's actually sort of a multifaceted. Um, conspiracy in that on the one hand, L. Ron Hubbard points his fingers at like the international bankers. Okay. Which has shades also, of anti-Semitism to yeah. it. And then the IRS is some is going to be quickly baked in the, or no? The, the IRS, no, the, the IRS is so low on the totem pole oh. um, as far as the, I mean, the international bankers, he would say runs everything. Got it. But they, but use that, that these bankers um, also use big pharma and big psych to control the population. And Scientology is famously against um, pharma and psych. And so this is sort of how L. Ron Hubbard characterizes like this big war between Scientology that's trying to set everyone free yeah. and big pharma and big psych that's trying to enslave everyone on the planet. Yeah, controlling their mind, controlling their body through chemicals and- And who controls the press, big pharma and big psych. So that there's a, a lot of correlation to other kinds of conspiracy theories. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's fascinating. But you asked the question, um, where, uh, why would all these people hold on to their stories? They don't, they would never want to leak. Like by even anyone who would want to leak would not, not even want to be a Scientologist anymore. Like yeah. if you truly believe, if you truly believe in Scientology and you got your shoulder to the wheel and you're a Sea Org member, you think Scientology is literally the only thing that can save every being on this planet from a fate of eternal amnesia and slavery, yeah. right? And so it's like, I mean, you've seen The Matrix, right? So you've got everyone, once you're unplugged from The Matrix and you realize, yeah, you could get plugged back in and live your nice life, but you're a slave. That's how Scientologists see this planet. They actually, they, they refer to Earth as a prison planet. I personally, because, because when, I, when I was in those shoes, I say there's nothing anybody could have said to me to get me to change how I felt and thought about Scientology. It's almost foolproof yeah. that the more evidence you try to present that there's something wrong with what Scientology is doing, the more you're just working for the psychs, yeah. you know? Uh, it's very, very difficult. I mean, most people who leave Scientology leave because they have ex had some personal experience that was just such a grave injustice that it just pushed them beyond uh, the point of what they were willing to experience. Very rare, I've never, I'm not sure I've really ever heard a story of someone going, yeah, I just woke up, you know, I just gradually realized it was all BS and drifted away. You know, it's usually like, no, I really believed and they treated me so horribly, I almost had no choice but to leave. And then the stories get pretty crazy. 
Meaning you don't care what's true anymore. You just have to leave yeah. with this, the, uh, the unpleasant feeling, the suffering here. Yeah. And this sort of goes back to um, wow. the conversation we're having about like, well, does Miscavige really believe? And I said, I could make an argument for the fact that he doesn't, right? Because I go, <laughs> it wouldn't be that hard to change the way Scientology treats people just a little bit. And you'd probably stop losing anyone because Scientologists already believe to such a strong degree, yeah. you have to be pretty freaking horrible to people to make them leave. And that's where you go, well, does Miscavige even want Scientology to expand? Because if he was really being clever about it, it seems like he could at least stop the bleeding mm -hmm. and yet he doesn't. So that's where you make the argument. Well, if he doesn't, then he must not want to. So his mind is corrupted to the point where he's not able to actually be a good businessman, essentially. It seems that way. The numbers of Scientologists have been going down and down and down since the early 90s. Oh yeah, I did a video about this. It's actually quite easy to get to the number. Mm. It's not more than 35,000 in the entire world. And that's being very generous and charitable. That's, I was intentionally generous. I broke it all down in a spreadsheet and everything. Yeah, what, can you give like some insights of how you get that info? Sure, there's about 175 to 200 Scientology organizations in the world. Anybody who's ever worked at these organizations know there's not more than 35 to 50 staff members per org. There's not more than one to 200 public Scientologists per org. I broke down the number of Sea Org members who'd be working at every continental management unit, middle management, international management. I broke down the mission network and I was generous. I mean, my numbers were like, if L. Ron Hubbard came back and they were doing an event, yeah. L. Ron Hubbard was coming back and announcing OT9 and 10. How many Scientologists could we scrape together in every city to come to this event? It wasn't more than 35,000. Now contrast that to what Scientology says. Millions, 10 million people. Oh yeah. Dozens of former Sea Org members from the international base have told stories of being assaulted by Miscavige. In fact, Mike Rinder, is probably the one person who's been assaulted by Miscavige more than anyone else. He's personally probably been assaulted dozens of times. Who is Mike Rinder? So the man Mike, here. One of the highest ranking executives in Scientology. The was, author. There you go, a billion years. <laughs> of a billion years. It's a, it really is a fantastic book. Cause Lex, the guy, the guy was born and raised in Scientology and worked personally with L. Ron Hubbard and worked personally with David Miscavige for decades. Like it doesn't get much more insider than that. It's a fantastic book. Um, he also narrates his own audio book too. I know you like the audio books. That's how I listen to it. Yeah. So Mike famously, uh, you know, I just said a moment ago, like someone who's treated so horribly, even though he still believed in Scientology, they did, he had no choice but to leave. And he tells, he tells the story in that book and he still believed in Scientology for years after he escaped, for years. Because there's this thing called the independent Scientology movement or the free zone or whatever. There are people who do Scientology outside of the Church of Scientology. Mm -hmm. There's just not many of them. But Mike was one of those people who was actually doing Scientology even after he left. Now, he no longer believes in that anymore and he doesn't do it. But, but, but even though he still believed, even though everything he knew was what he was leaving behind, he still had to leave it behind. The final thing is when uh, he got to a point where he was no longer being forced to lie to protect L. Ron Hubbard. He was now being forced to lie to protect David Miscavige. Yeah. And specifically, it was about the allegations of having been assaulted by Miscavige. Mike Rinder was at some um, event, it might've been a grand opening for a building, a Scientology building in London. And I believe it was John Sweeney, at that time a BBC journalist, who you know stuck a camera and a microphone in Mike's face. Is it true David Miscavige assaulted you? Is it true? And Mike denied it on camera. Mm -hmm. And then turned around and to himself is like, this is what my life has been reduced to? Lying to protect David Miscavige? This used to be about L. Ron Hubbard. This used to be about Scientology. Yeah. Now it's about protecting this douchebag? And Miscavige had just issued orders that was gonna send Mike off to Australia. Misca like Miscavige is sadistic. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is without question. Sadistic meaning? He enjoys inflicting pain upon others. 
So he very specifically was going to tell Mike, tell Rinder, or tell that cocksucker, we're shipping him off to Australia. He's never going to see his wife and his kids again, essentially. And that's when Mike was like, they were the only reason I hadn't already left. Yeah. So if I follow the orders, I'm going to lose them. If I leave Scientology, I'm going to lose them. At least if I leave Scientology, I'll be free of something. It's fucking sad. He does a very good job talking about all of this in the book. Mm -hmm. And it, it took him, it took him like four or five years to get that book done. Like it's a, it's a, it's a polished version. It's a polished version of his story. And, and, and I think Mike's about getting ready to start his own YouTube channel. So that'll be a lot of fun. Actually, Mike comes on my channel all the time. Yeah, you guys, you guys do a thing together, right? Yeah, we do uh, Three Amigos with me and Mike Rinder and Mark Headley. <laughs> That's why I gave you Mark's book, because I, I thought maybe you would uh, know him from our little Three Amigos, our Mondays with Mike and Mark videos. Mark Headley, blown for good behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology. So he escaped from the International Base on a motorcycle. It's, it's a wild story. Nice. I, won't, I won't even try to do it justice. Who's, but, a, who's but, a better writer of the two of them? <laughs> You're not going to get me there. Like, <laughs> right. I'm trying to be an investigative journalist for once. Mike and Mark are both on the board of the Aftermath Foundation with yeah. me. Yeah. So, who's better looking? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's one of my justifications for just putting up content every day. Is every video is just an excuse to, in some little way, promote the Aftermath Foundation. And and I do that again. One to genuinely help people escape, and two because I know it drives David Miscavige crazy. If you look in your own heart, is there anger there? I don't think it's anger. I don't hate, I don't hate Scientology. I don't hate David Miscavige. Um, I don't even hate my experience in Scientology. So you're able to accept the good yeah. from your experience. Yeah, absolutely. But it's also the only path that I traveled. Right. So I tend, okay, a little less so these days, but um, earlier in life, I tended to attribute all my, po all positive characteristics in me to Scientology. Cause in my uh, simplistic way of thinking, I was like, what else could it possibly be attributed to? Right. That's a very black and white way of seeing it. True. But like another example would be like, I didn't go to school, Lex. I, I stopped going to school in the seventh grade. But people go, but you sound so smart. And what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to say, well, it's because of Scientology? Like, how do I answer that question? Like, if it's the only path I traveled, yeah. how do I answer that question? I don't necessarily want to give Scientology credit, but what the hell am I supposed to point to? Sure. You know? It's almost like, let me try to, let me try to frame it. I wasn't trying to get kicked out of Scientology. I was trying to not get kicked out of Scientology. I, you know, so what happened first, first my mom got kicked out for basically talking some smack about David Miscavige. And then they go to me and they go, okay, you've got to disconnect from your mom or you're going to get kicked out. And I lied about that. I was like, okay, I'll disconnect. But I never did. For a couple of years, I lied my ass off about it. Eventually they were like, this guy's going to keep lying to us, right? And they're like, yeah, like, all right, you're out. So then they go to my wife. So you got to divorce your husband or you're going to get kicked out. And she goes, no. That's a hell of a statement from her. It's going to get harder from here. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to. Okay. So I'll try to get, I'll try to do my You don't seem this. like a man who's afraid of hard things. Okay. So she's like, No. So then they go to her parents and they say, you've got to disconnect from your daughter and your three granddaughters or you're going to get kicked out. But they have three other kids who are Scientologists, who have spouses who are Scientologists, who have grandkids. So I feel like up until that point, everybody was sort of making a decision for themselves and what would be best for themselves. Until they get to her parents. And then they're like, which grandkids are we going to lose? Okay. At the part where they were trying to get me to disconnect from my mom, there were hours that I spent talking to them going, you know, guys, there's another way. You it doesn't have to go this way. There's another way that ends well for all of us. And that wasn't even considered. And I go like... They created this monster. And that's a fact. And that's why I take joy in it. 
when people when people ask me is Scientology a destructive cult, I don't even have to get into all the academic discussions of what's a religion and what's a cult and what's the difference. I go, as long as they destroy families like that, they're a cult. I mean, it started with L. Ron Hubbard laying out a policy framework, a policy structure that if interpreted and applied in the worst possible way, with the worst possible judgment, can be abused in that way. I would make the argument that if an Annie Broker had taken over, that Scientology policy does have enough little um, caveats baked into it that even the policies about disconnection could be interpreted and implemented in a non-destructive way. There is room for judgment and discretion. And Miscavige has just created the worst possible version of Scientology. And that's that's where you sort of get that argument of, does he even want Scientology to succeed? Because he seems to be hell-bent on making sure that he doesn't. Yeah. And, and I don't want to see him make it succeed, but it does bring that question up of like, what are his motivations? Can he not see that he's destroying the thing he's supposed to be expanding? <laughs> No, I genuinely don't hate them. Do you forgive them? 100%. There's no one I look at in Scientology that I go, how dare you? If I was in their shoes, having to you know, operate under David Miscavige's orders, I would have done the same thing and I would have loved it. Truthfully, I don't blame any of them. I mean, I take the, the opposite approach. If they knew what I knew, they'd be doing what I'm doing. Yeah. If they knew what I knew and believed it, they'd be doing what I'm doing. They're not dumb. It's not, it's, not, it's not dumb people in Scientology. And it's one of the reasons I like putting up content on my channel so they can see, hey, like if you're a Scientologist, mm -hmm. you look at that and you go, hey, he seems like he's doing well. He's kind of, he's happy. He's a positive guy. He's a good communicator. He knows what he's talking about. He's not lying. He's not exaggerating. I don't exaggerate anything mm -hmm. on my channel. I don't make up anything. And this is actually comes from an experience I had from 1998 to 2000. I was living in LA. I sort of had a two-year period of my life where I actually had almost no contact with Scientology. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I found my way onto the internet. And there was a website. It might have been ESMB, X Scientology Message, but whatever it was, it was at that time the main source of critical information about Scientology on the internet. And I looked at it. And remember, I was still a true believer. Mm -hmm. And I looked at this and it was so... Uh, offensive, um, insulting, uh, hyperbolic, exaggerated. I was like, oh, just a bunch of bullshit. I was in Scientology for 16 more years. If what I had seen on the internet about critical of Scientology, if what I had seen when I had seen it was something that actually resonated with me, that I was like, oh, that I believed was true, that seemed credible, I would have gotten out of Scientology 16 years earlier. So I was like, how can I help create an experience on the internet that if a Scientologist stumbles upon it, it will resonate with them instead of repelling them? And that is exactly what I have set out to do and what I believe I've accomplished. He genuinely loves it. And also Miscavige does, there's one celebrity who does have the most unique experience in Scientology, and that is Tom. Scientology hires all of Tom's staff. Uh, there, there are no, uh, all of Tom's staff are subject to interrogations by Scientology, not only in the hiring process, but during the employment. Like David Miscavige and Scientology runs Tom Cruise's life and his production company and his household staff. Do you imagine there's some personal connection there where they're just, they like each other a lot? Best friends. I mean, it's them against the world yeah. is how they see it. I think it's pretty easy to see how that works be between the two of them. If they could figure out how to do all that without destroying families and yeah. bankrupting its members, they might actually have a future. That's why, like, it's funny because sometimes I feel like it's like, like I'm rooting for them to like succeed and do it right. Yeah. And I'm not, but it's an interesting academic discussion to have of like, uh, we we can all see how much people will sacrifice in the names of belief and religion. Yeah, we can see how much Scientologists sacrifice based on what they already believe. 
if he would just start treating people less horribly, yeah. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? It yeah. might actually have a future. But Not it's that also- I want it to. I've actually come out and said definitively, uh, I do not know of a single person who stays in Scientology because they're afraid of being blackmailed. It's just not a thing. It's just not a thing. Wow. Uh, does Scientology have enough information to black sell, blackmail someone if they wanted to? Well, sure. I mean, and it doesn't even have to be true. It could just be lies. Who cares? Who knows? Scientology can say whatever the hell they want. So that's the thing. It doesn't even have to be true. Yeah. And actually, that would be the argument against blackmailing. Like in order for Scientology to blackmail you with that information, they'd actually have to represent that, yes, he really did tell us this. And it's like, well, well then why are you spilling secrets of members, right? Like it sets a bad precedent. What are some of the sins according to Scientology? Most of the sins from a Scientology perspective are just doing or saying anything that brings, brings um, disrepute to Scientology itself, right? Um, uh, remember, they don't. It's not like Christianity where there's rules. If you break this rule, you're not getting into heaven. Yeah, because Scientology doesn't think about things. Oh, that there's way. the drug. You can't do drugs, right? You can't do uh, drugs, uh, and you can't take any psychotropic medications. And no medications, almost at all. You're allowed to take medications. It's just um, there's no rules expressly uh, prohibiting it. It's just most Scientologists tend not to. You can take Advil, but many Scientologists won't. Okay. Um, yeah. you just can't take anything prescribed by a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or any drugs that are psychotropic drugs. I mean, SSRIs are considered probably the closest thing to pure evil, uh, in the world of Scientology. What about, weird question, what about sex? Is there boundaries on what's... There used to not be. It's become very puritanical in, in the last many decades it, for a reason I can't actually explain. Like, Miscavige does seem to be infatuated with controlling sex. Like that, that is one thing about Miscavige version of Scientology that's gotten very strange. I mean, L. Ron Hubbard even specifically wrote a policy that says we are no longer going to regulate in any way the bedroom activities of people. Mm -hmm. He literally said from this point on, no one is allowed to be subject to any justice actions of any kind whatsoever for anything they do in their sexual lives. Uh, but that was still did not give uh, permission for gay relationships. That was still referring to straight stuff and uh, monogamous only. Can you do promise? Like, can can you do open marriages and open relationships? According to that L. Ron Hubbard policy, you can. Yeah, but you know, I think he wrote that policy before he created the C organization. Mm-hmm. And then what happened is this is actually how this came into effect. Uh, he created the C organization. You had a lot of people on a ship, and everybody was just banging each other, and it created just a nightmare of personal relationship that it was, it was making production impossible. Not because everybody was spending so much time banging, but because everybody was so upset about who was banging him. 100%. But not because I'm like fully conversant with the academic uh, differentiations between what's a religion and what's a cult. I mean, Scientology would say, well, all small new religions are cults. And I don't know, that's probably true. And some people would say all religions are cults. And I'd be like, depends on how you define religion and it depends on how you define cults. But I just fall back on my thing of like, if you're destroying families yeah. and bankrupting your members, you're a cult. Yeah. That, that's how that's... I look at it. Hardcore. And they... Like, but i'll tell you i train jujitsu as well and i have found that community of people to be one of the most loving Mm -hmm. and uh helpful uh group of people ever shout out to john keller gracie baja clearwater um no but seriously like it's one of uh, it's one of the reasons i continue to do it despite my back my hip my shoulder it's like it's just such a cool group of guys It's kind of remarkable they haven't been able to capitalize on these bot armies because there's one thing that they have. It's a lot of tax-free money that they got nothing else better to do with. Yeah, right. So, you can invest. You know, they just, they should give you a call. Like, they just don't have the right people, apparently. <laughs> uh, that is the one way they effectively put their money to use is lobbyists and attorneys, um, you know, judges. Very rarely have they ever, ever been able just to get a politician on their side. It's the behind-the-scenes people. You know, Greta Van Susteren is a very high level, long-term Scientologist. And her husband, I always get it wrong. It's either Jim Cole or John Cole. I always get it wrong. Uh, He's a very powerful attorney who has a lot, uh, wields a lot of influence behind the scenes. 
And that's just one example. Like the reason why that's an interesting example is because he's actually a Scientologist and he travels in those circles. Scientology though, it's money goes to good use by hiring non-Scientologists, retired judges, attorneys, lobbyists. It really is how they get almost anything done. Like Miscavige himself is not hobnobbing and glad hanging and shaking hands and meeting these folks. It's the non-Scientologist professionals who work behind the scenes on Scientology's behalf. I meant more the courts and courts. regulators, not the police department. But well, for example, uh, it can come down to something as simple as this. Sci in Clearwater, Scientology hires Clearwater police to do off-duty work for them. They pay like three times the normal off-duty rate. So they will, even though I'm not aware of anyone on the Clearwater PD who's actually a Scientologist, mm -hmm. they basically end up with, they would call them allies or safe points. Got it. Right? People who like will literally operate as Scientology spies. You know, if someone comes in and follows a report about some child sex case, someone in the Clearwater PD is calling Sarah Heller at the Office of Special Affairs at the Flag Latin base to let her know, hey, heads up, we got a thing coming in. And then Scientology can run around and go talk to all the Scientologists who have knowledge about this and either get them out of Clearwater, or, you know. Yeah, I call it soft corruption. So on another example, you have um, the mayor of Clearwater, Frank Hibbard. Um, well, he used to, uh, when, when he won his recent election, he stepped down from some of these nonprofits that he served on. Mm -hmm. But the nonprofits that he served on also gets millions of dollars of donations from some of Scientology's richest Clearwater members, right? You have one of the mayor's best friends, Joe Burdett, literally a paid lobbyist for Scientology. Mm -hmm. So that creates a chilling effect on anyone who's gonna be talking smack about Scientology because his friends are on their damn payroll. Mm -hmm. So um, I call it soft corruption. It's not illegal. It's not illegal, um, but it's how Scientology wields influence. And what's, what's, what's ironic is that a lot of these people who work on Scientology's behalf actually secretly hate Scientology. I think it's one of those things that once you've seen behind the curtain and you see the Wizard of Oz is just a silly man, you just don't have any fear. Now, it's one of these things like people say, oh, you're so brave. And I go, eh, what's that quote? Bravery is, you know, being a soldier and being afraid and going in any way. Mm -hmm. It's not brave to run in if you don't think you, nothing's going to happen to you. Like, so I, I'm just trying to, like, I do not hold myself up as an example of bravery because yeah. I, it's not like, oh, they could destroy me, but I don't care. No, there's not a damn thing they can do to me. And it's one of, that's one of the reasons I continue to put out content every day to just basically go, hey, still here. <laughs> I dare you to try to do something about it, but you can't. And hope that that also serves as kind of an example for other people to go, if this schmo can do it yeah. and they can't do anything else to him, then maybe I can do it too. Because mm -hmm. I would love it. I would love there for be a 20 channels where former Scientologists talk about their experience. The fear was knowing how the family was going to be destroyed and yeah. trying to prevent that. I was terrified of that happening, but it happened. There's nothing left to be afraid of. And that's kind of the thing. Like they created this beast and the same is true for Mark Headley. The same is true for Mike Rinder. I, I said, they've essentially created a Scientology proof virus, a Scientology resistant strain <laughs> by throwing everything they have at us yeah. for so many years. They have just, <laughs> through natural selection, created people who just do not give a damn about anything they could or would do. And maybe there is something a little wrong with me. Because when I get a phone call from someone like, I just got this phone call about you, and it's clear that it's Scientology PIs doing work behind the scenes, I get really excited. I get really excited. I don't get nervous. I'm like, oh, no, what's happening? I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to be exciting. I'm like, okay. Because everything they try to do to me, I'm going to figure out how to reflect it back on them and make them look ridiculous. Just, yes. If you, most of my episode <clears throat> on the Lee Remini in the Aftermath show was talking about me and my twin brother. It's just a pretty horrible story. 
it's just a pretty horrible story. So I do have a younger brother who's still in Scientology and disconnected from me, but I never had much of a relationship um, with that brother, um, really, to begin with, right? Um, <clears throat> but my twin brother died when I was like 23 or 24. And that was, without any question, a direct result of um, our Scientology experience, you know? He died in a car accident that wasn't technically his fault or anything. Like he wasn't even the one driving. But uh, the fact, the, the specific fact of his death was not meaning like the, the, the fact and the manner of his death and time wasn't like specifically because of Scientology. But our story and how, uh, where our relationship got to and how he was even in a position of having something like that happen to him is directly attributable to Scientology. Two moments would equal the darkest moment. It, it would be that and also just the period of, you know, six, nine, 12 months of impending doom. Knowing that my wife's whole family was going to be obliterated and that there's nothing we could do about it. And, uh, and kind of telling ourselves every step of the way it wasn't really going to happen, you know? <clears throat> and I really felt like, you ever watch the Ozarks? Mm -hmm. I felt like Marty Bird. Now, this was happening before the Ozarks, but when I watch the Ozarks and I see that character, the entire world is crumbling down around him and all he can, all he did like, all right, what's the next step? I watch Marty Bird and I go, that's my fucking spirit animal. Because you can only control what you can control. And um, you can't keep Scientology from destroying your family. And and literally, like, I, I it's funny. I've, I mentioned this show a lot because I watch that and I go, like, that's exactly how I felt. You know, I talk about this six months or nine or 12 months, whatever it was of, of impending doom. It's not like I was an emotional wreck during that time. You know, in private I was, but it's not like, I was just freaking out. It was like, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. The world's going to keep spinning. I can't control it. This is hard. I can't believe this is happening. But tomorrow's a new day. Um, I've never personally, even at the darkest times, I've never experienced anything that I would characterize as depression. Certainly not ever any suicidal thoughts or anything. And even in the darkest of times, I... And again, this one thing I go, is it because of Scientology or is it just me? There really is an emotional detachment. There almost has to be. And it's a cold calculation. What, what are my options? What do yeah. I do here? And then once I figure out the answer to that question, I'm actually quite chipper and happy. You know, like that's sort of my default. Like you could give me six horrible options. Once I figure out the best of those six, I'm going to feel like I just had a pretty good day. And he almost gets pissed off at everyone around him for being so pouty about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll but you know, watch it's, that show again, the same way again. Oh, that's beautiful. But you know, beautiful. it's like you know, it's still simmering there, right under the surface, like pretty damn close to the surface. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And um, people sometimes ask about recovery and whatnot, and like, what does that look like, and what does that mean? And it sort of goes back to kind of the emotional detachment. Is I go, what the fuck does recovery even mean? If you're an alcoholic and you're recovering, you know what that means. I used to drink. I don't drink now. Well, I used to be in a cult and I'm not in a cult now. How else am I supposed to feel about this for someone to be like, it seems like you've recovered. What the fuck does that even mean? Like, I, I'm sure some academic has an answer to that question. I'm not someone who particular. I don't spend any time thinking about that. My recovery is success and a little bit of trolling and revenge, yeah. but mostly success, yeah. you know? What does it mean to be a recovered former cult member? What, you don't cry when people ask you about your brother? I don't know what it means. Yeah. Um, I've never had therapy, but not because I'm still like against it from Scientology. I just like, I'm not going to pay to talk to someone. <laughs> do you know where else I could do that? Scientology. Yeah. Now, I, I know there's a lot of people going like, oh boy. He, I know there's a lot. I'm not shitting on therapy. I would rather have a beer with my friend and talk about this shit yeah. than talk to a professional for $200 an hour. If I can make my kids happy, that's success to me. What advice would you give to your kids on how to live 
Travel the world. A life they can be proud of. Travel the world? Travel the world. Um, get rid of friends who don't push you up and tear, and don't celebrate your success. It's, it's, it's hard to give that advice to young children because kids are always so catty. <laughs> but honestly, it's like when I see uh, that, that really is, I, I just think not just advice to my kids, but some of the best advice to anybody. Yeah. If you've got anyone around you who doesn't celebrate your success, just spend less time <laughs> with those people. <Yeah. laughs> Surround yourself with people who actually want to celebrate your success and push you to succeed. I think that's true. I think it's even more important at a young age because if if at a young age you get used to be, being around people who kind of take joy in tearing you down, then that's what you become accustomed to. Yeah. You know? And, and I just think, you know, having friends who love you and support you is just about the closest thing to the true meaning of life. This is the Lex Free Podcast.